has been a very good friend and a master of uh, open approaches and uh, well he's a wizard I can say that uh, I have seen uh, him operate I've been together with him in Russia for a long number of years uh, maybe from 2013 onwards we've been teaching together and uh, he's a good friend very good human being and an excellent surgeon so uh, Luis Borba, the stage is yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, IP. Thank you, Dr. John Bennett. Wonderful presentation by Juan. Always perfect. The anatomy is perfect. The, the video is perfect. Like the, the Latino way, you know? You are proud to be Latinos. <laughs> You're proud to have people like you. Uh, I'll talk about the cavernal sinus surgery, but before I talk about surgery, we need to talk about the concept. During many, many years, the cavernal sinus was, we call no man's land. Nobody could touch. If you touch, you have severe morbidity, or you die with severe complications, carotid artery injuries, and ocular motor deficit. But Professor Vinko Dolenk changed the history of the cavernal sinus surgery. He unlocked the cavernal sinus and showed that it's possible to do a safe removal of several tumors. After came the endoscopic endonasal approach that showed that the tumor that was not possible to see from below, now you can see and you can remove safely. During these years, the improvement in the surgical technique to treat cavernal sinus is incredible. However, we understand also that not only the anatomy of the cavernal sinus from the lateral, from below, but to understand the natural history of some disease. In some surgery that you use to do, some surgical procedures that you use to do, Today, we know that the natural history of the disease can be safer than any kind of treatment. If you see this paper, if you read this paper from, from France, the natural history of covenant sinus meningioma show incredible results. Look at this. 19% increase in size, 7-1 is stable, 9.4 decrease. And the follow-up's not short almost 10 years. In the only five cases that they grow, you see, and treat radiation, any kind of modality of radiation, they have some complication. It means that before to be surgeons, we should be doctors. We are treating human beings. We are treating patients. We need to know what's the best way to treat the patient. Some patients like this, asymptomatic, just headache, no optinary compression, no oculomotor deficit, no other symptoms. Maybe it's the best way and leave the patient and just follow. Maybe the natural history of this tumor will be much better than any kind of treatment. But you make, make me worry when you go to the most important, or not most important, the largest meeting in the world. 
the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. And you see this advertisement in the Lexel Gamma Knife booth. Look at this. It's a simple temporal meningioma with a very short attachment to the tentorium. And this is the case, is the advertisement, it's the propaganda for gamma knife. Maybe you are selling to this young lady the iPad, that the iPad that, that she never asked for. You should understand that some treatment has complication, as surgery has complication, radiation therapy also has complication. Not in the time of the procedure, but with the path. If you give more time, you can have more complication. And the most frayed meningioma, the radiation induced meningioma, that several people that after second war receive very low doses of radiation to treat tinea, came back later with radiation induced meningioma. It means that the most common treatment today to cavernosinus lesions, the radiation therapy, maybe not the answer to treat pathology in this area. What makes us more, how do you say, worry when you see the people radiation induced meningioma with radiation? It makes us more sad, and you see very prominent skull based surgeons to be a co author of this article. You have to learn and understand what you are doing for our patient. What's the best way to treat the patient, not the tool that you have, you need to use. This paper was not published, it was Dr. Almeth, the paper it was very difficult to, he went three times to publication, came back, came back, came back. It showed that you control of radio surgery, 80%, just observation, 75. And radiation after growth, sorry, using Portuguese, okay? 45% of control. It means that you are treating tumors that you never grow and put in the same box of good results of radiation. What you change in the history? technology, instruments, and anatomy. Now you know the anatomy, you know where you can go. You can reach the cavernous sinus from several routes. Inferior, medial, lateral, superior, and inferior. You need to use the approach for that situation not the approach that you know, that you want to know how to do it. Do the best for the patient, not the best for you. From the nose you can reach with the endoscope, with maybe if the microscope is more lateral, the transpeterygoid approach that they are using a lot for more lateral exposure. You need to understand not only an anatomy of the cavernous sinus, but an anatomy also of the sinoid sinus. It gives you the window, the big window that can work. You have it, this kind of sinus will be a little bit more difficult to have to drill, to open a big window that's more difficult to expose. We need to understand how the tumor behaves. The beautiful work of pr Professor Juan Miranda that I've shown the next slide, show us that the tumor give you the approach. You just follow the tumor. If the same thing happens with the mafia, no, no, no. If you're not reach somebody from the mafia, just follow the money. You catch the guy. In the, the cavernous signs and they're coming from the nose, just follow the tumor. You catch the guy. 
You can do this with endoscope, maybe you can do with the microscope. As Professor Miranda showed in his nice work, you just follow it. Follow the tumor, the tumor thing. If a soft, like pituitary tumor, you can just follow it. You can do wider like this. And also, you can follow the tumor, the, full, the tumor will give you the root. You can come this and follow it. You are totally extra and just follow the tumor. Sometimes you need to expose more. And there is no better way to learn skull-based surgery than go to the lab. If you go to the lab, you can reproduce what you learn in the anatomy, what you do in surgery. Skull-based surgery, we will learn in the lab. We don't learn skull-based surgery in the patient. You should spend a lot of time of your life, maybe months, years, to learn the skull-based anatomy. And after that, go to the OR. This way you can reproduce that you do in anatomy, you can do in surgery. I show some tricks, not show the whole cranial orbital zygomatic approach or the whole Dolink approach, some tricks to avoid simple complication that the people always complain. See, our friend temporal muscle is very important to keep and to save this fascia, the deep fascia. If you keep the deep fascia, if you save the deep fascia, you can you never have atrophy of the temporalis muscle. You have no this statical complication. At the hours the patient complain. There is a small hole here, this in the cap. Today I'm using more the Dolink approach than the cranial orbital zygomatic. I think you can use, you can have the same exposure if you have a good anesthesia and remove the anterior clinor. You can do cranial orbital zygomatic approach in one piece. You can do first the pternal approach and after the orbital zygomatic. You decide, independent of approach, of the way that you cut the bone. Is the idea to come anterior lateral or more uh, anterior to posterior or lateral to lateral? Before open, we have to prepare to avoid complication because this we use large incision to have our best friend in skull-based surgery, that is the pericranial flap. If you have a nice pericranial flap, very large pericranial flap, you close the base of the skull, independent of the hole that you do in the base of the skull. If you open this phenoid sign, if you open this the thymoid side, we have a pericranial flap, vascularized flap. We know that we change the history of endoscopic endonasal approach was the vascularized flap. To the cranial approach, it's the same situation. Independent of substitute that you use, the vascularized flap is our best friend. If you are not cut the zygoma, you need some tricks to avoid aesthetic complication. One of that, never take out the arch. Cut anti as anterior as you can, as posterior as you can. It just displace, keeping the masseter muscle just below. You gain just one centimeter, but you gain angle to work from below to up from down to up. You look in this direction from down to up. It's very important, this situation. And if you cut the, the zygoma, do a wide cut, as anterior, as posterior, and the muscle has to pass through this hole. I saw many, many times the people showing cutting the zygoma very short, you don't have the space. If, to, if you want to cut the zygoma, you need to space to displace inferiorly 
the temporal is mass. Especially in this situation, you have a very huge temporal muscle. And the head construct is very, very important. In the end, you have construct the hoof of the orbit. You need to have the exposure. You can go subtemporal, you can go frontal, you can go cavernous sinus, you can go to the petrous apex. You decide the approach you need, you decide the extension of the craniotomy, sometimes large. Sometimes it is smaller. There is no fight. The people say, I use very small craniotomy. Do what you need. Do what your patient need. Don't do the surgery that you believe to do to everybody the same approach, not this situation. There is one small piece of bone that unlock and change the history of the Cavernosine surgery is the anterior clinoid. If you remove the anterior clinoid, you change completely the history, you change completely the exposure of the cavernosine. It's one of the tricks. There are three ways. One that Professor Duncan used to do. The other one, you go inside the declinoid, drill completely the clinoid and remove. And then is another situation that I used to, to do for vascular disease. For aneurysm, I prefer to remove the clinoid intradurally because the idea is to clip the aneurysm. You remove the clinoid as much as you need. For tumors, you need to remove extradural because you need to sometimes kill the vascularization of the, 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 the tumor. You need to expose the dura. In the great majority of the meningioma, you need to remove the dura. It's anterior clinoidal process removal, it's not standard. In every situation, you do the way that you need. See, you remove, maybe you need a little bit more, you go and remove more as you need. But there is one area in the cavernous sinus that I believe, at least in my hand, I'm talking about meningiomas, okay? I'm not talking about pituitary, I'm not talking about chordoma that are soft. You, you, you can take it. Talk about meningioma that's the most common tumor in this area. This area here, the superior orbital fissure. When the tumor is in the superior orbital fissure, in my hand, I cannot remove safely. When the tumor invades the superior orbital fissure, not when the tumor is just touching the superior orbital fissure. See, sometimes there is no real invasion the tumor just going lateral to the superior orbital fissure. In this situation here, it will be more difficult, more difficult to remove. And the great majority of the time, I prefer to leave a small piece of tumor in the superior orbital fissure to avoid this kind of complication. You should to go to the lab to do the, the, the peeling, as Professor Ipshiran just showed, there is some tricks. Peeling is peeling, is the cadaver dissection. Peeling is not cutting. You need to peel, to peel the face. Uh -huh. How the ladies does, you see? You go extra dura, you open the canal, the orbit canal. Always before do any kind of work around the opt nerve. Open the opt canal, open, cut the false form ligament, totally liberate the nerve because the damage of the nerve will be in that area by the false form ligament. Because this is very important to free totally the opt nerve. This way you can work safely, sometimes mobilize. If there is no bone, there is no ligament. We remove the anterior clinoid. 
we expose the area here and we start to do. Now we have the control of the ICA. We need the peeling of the middle fossa. This, we are working totally extra cavernous sinus. We do this for cavernous sinus meningioma. We do this for tumors located in the area that is more in the, in the, in the sphenoid wing. You kill the vascularization. It would be much easier to remove a sphenoid wing when you do this peeling. After you come to the back, identify the minomeningia artery, see? And you can cut the minomeningia artery and go posterior thing. But in this, uh, I will limit to this anterior part, this part. You open the dura, you expose this. If the tumor goes to the posterior fossa, you cut the middle meningeal, remove the petrous apex, mobilize the fifth nerve, you can play around the base of the skull. But this area here I want to show you is the most interest area, the coronal sinus. This is the area where the great majority of the meningioma arise. And if you take the tumor that is in this part, you can safely remove. Because the, the tumor, the nerve are separate. The Parkinson triangle is a large triangle in the cavernous sinus. And you can work on it and separate the area there. I'll show some cases later. See? See? When you have all the exposure, proximal control, distal control, vascular control, short instruments, open widely the sylvian fissure, working in the system, it's very important to do the surgery. This is the case that the people show that say this cavernocytic meningioma, it's not cavernocytic meningioma, it's anteroclinoidal meningioma. It's extra cavernocytic. You can go and do the peeling of the middle fossa, remove the anteroclinoid, remove the vascularization and cut total the vascularization of the tumor. First extradural, after intradural. Using the anatomy of the cavernous sinus, use the understanding of the cavernous sinus to remove tumor that is not in the cavernous sinus, but will be safely and easily to remove this tumor. There is a situation like this, that the tumor is in the cavernous sinus. There is one part that's extra cavernous sinus. There is tumor in this area. We use the anatomy to follow the tumor. We take the tumor that was inside the sphenoid sinus. We did the peeling of the middle fossa. You dissect totally the cavernous sinus. You remove the tumor in the, sphen in the sphenoid, in the petrous apex, but this part, that's just in the superior orbital fissure. I prefer, I prefer to leave this small tumor there. This, this way you can do the surgery. And you can liberate the fight. One of the trick of the cavernous sinus surgery is liberate totally the fifth nerve. If you liberate the fifth nerve, you can mobilize medially lateral, superior, inferior, and open the window. And this is the microsurgery that Professor Yashagil just showed. And open the sieve and fissure is not a big deal. I saw last two weeks ago, the people was very worried about opening the sieve and fissure. Oh my God. Oh my God, it's microsurgery, it's our life. We cannot train young neurosurgeons, tell them, that open the sieve and fissure is dangerous. They do microsurgery work in the system is dangerous. Please don't do that. See, they see in the pre and the post op, I left. This is small piece. That I just follow this part, the superior orbital fissure. There are situations that is very small tumor. It's the first one. Now I have three cases like this. I become more brave. Six nerve, no pain. What's it? Inflammatory disease, cancer, maybe meningioma. 
I treat with high doses of steroids. There is no change. Maybe invasion, maybe meningioma. I did the surgery to do the diagnosis. What's happened? I did the peel of middle fossa. When I saw the Parkinson triangle, the tumor was there. It was a meningioma. It was very small meningioma located in that area that you can follow the six from inside to outside and remove this small tumor there. No radiation, no other kind of treatment. You can safely remove just understanding the anatomy without opening the dura. Without opening the seat, you work it totally extra dural with control of the ICA, with control of the sixth nerve, proximal and distal control of the ICA. It's very important when you do any kind of work, vascular, tumors, any kind of disease in the skull base. If you have a big vessels in front of you, you will deal with big vessels like carotid artery. You need proximal and distal control because bleeding can happen, complication can happen, but you need to be prepared. If you are prepared, you are okay. In the pre and post-op, you see the small here, here, and preservation. She had six after two, three months and she recovered. See, she is okay. See this tumor here? See? Gone. No radiation, no other kind of surgery. This patient is free. There are situations like this, very similar. I prefer to leave this small piece that is in the superior after after official, the superior part. Because when it's inside the nerve, it will be very difficult and the patient will have morbidity, independent of the hand. Professor Dolan said some years ago, he regret the several patients that he tried to remove totally the meningioma, the coverno sinus in the superior orbital fissure and the patient wake up with deficit and the recovery was not totally. There are situations as pituitaries, 99% of pituitary you do by the nose. You can follow the money or follow the tumor. But there are situations that you go intradural. Professor Juan Miranda just showed the tumor that he came from the nose and went intradural and go there and remove. Maybe it's okay for him. Maybe for him he has a lot of experience. Is possible come from the nose? Maybe it's possible. He showed that it's possible. When I ask you, what's safer? Open the sieving fissure, identify, identify the artery, short instrument, your entire life is microsurgery. Very nice control. Come from the head, do the transcranial approach, remove it on tyroclinoid, Remove the, the, the posterior clinoid. Open widely the sieve and fissure. See, this patient has surgery before. The tumor changed the thing. You are going superior entrance of the cavernous sinus. Do a small peeling, but the great majority of the time in pituitary adenoma, we use the superior wall. See? of the cavernous sinus, you can work and just follow the tumor in this direction like this. The third nerve will be there, I'll show you him the, the, the sequence. We are working short, control, and seeing how the instrument, pituitary glands here, see the middle wall here, and had it from the nose, we are showing from the head, the superior wall here, the carotid lateral, you can mobilize the carotid in the cavernous sinus. You can go medial to the carotid artery. You can go lateral to the carotid artery. You can expose the area, the whole area there. You see that in the part that is medial ulcer here. See the optic nerve. You can drill more, remove more. You can move, move more anterior clinoid and follow this part. You can see the part that is the third nerve here. 
who can mobilize the third nerve, who can open the trigon of oculomotor trigon to liberate totally the five, to go now lateral to, to, the, third, to the third nerve, and mobilize the five, not the third, sorry, and remove this dura and expose the whole area here. This situation is, see, you can do safely if you know the anatomy, see, totally liberated the third nerve. In the end of the surgery, you have all the, bar, the perforators, have the basilar artery, you have the cavernous sinus, the superior wall, have the temporal lobe, you open widely the sieve fissure. I say again, open widely the sieve fissure. See, you see, you have all the exposure here in this area. This is microsurgery with skull-based techniques. You can do this safely. You can do this always in CDC. In the post-op, the patient will be like this. Third nerve palsy. But in the follow-up, the patient will be like this. Completely recovering. It's happened with pituitaries, it's happened with chordomas, it's happened with trigeminal schwannoma. It's not always happened with meningioma. I divide cavernosinus meningioma in uh, cavernosinus surgery in meningioma and non-meningioma. Non-meningioma, completely different, different uh, approach, different treatment. Who has large tumor like this. This patient was a doctor. He was treating the cicabergolin. He starts to improve the doses. See, the tumor is not coming. He had a bleed, terrible bleed inside the tumor. And he became hemiparetic. We decided to do the surgery just to decompress. What's happened? We did the surgery, we follow the tumor, we follow from subarachnoid space to intracavernous sinus, you just follow. And this is the follow-up, you get a very nice radical removal. And incredible, but this case is now, this patient is not using cabergolin or bromocriptine. It's not common. The great majority of the case they, they need, but this case is very interesting. Because this I'm, I'm showing this now, see? It's better. Sometimes you need approach that to use the temporal bone or anterior petrosal or posterior petrosal. In this situation, the great majority of the tumor are not in the cavernous sinus, are in the macular scape. And the people say, oh, there is a tumor in the cavernous sinus. No, there is no tumor in the cavernous sinus. The tumor is coming from outside to inside, from the extra cavernous sinus to the intra cavernous sinus. That's the trick. Totally liberate the five, the fifth nerve, the trigeminal nerve. Mobilize the trigeminal nerve and follow the money. You can do this. You can come from extra, you come to intra and follow. See, the five is come here to this anterior part. Here, there is no invasion of the cavernous sinus in the macular scape. Just follow the anatomy is very important in this situation. And you follow the nerve, the five, the third, the four, and just follow from outside to inside. There is another situation that the people say, oh, this is crazy, difficult. Let's remove the posterior posa. Let's do a retroseek. Let's leave the small part in the cavernous sinus and give radiation. 99% of the people in the world will do like this. But if you see this MRI, Look at what you see here. It's the fifth nerve. It's the trigeminal nerve. It means that the tumor is in the macoscale. 
and you can come from the posterior force. In this case, I did a petrosal approach and work anterior and posterior to sigmoid signs. It's the beauty of skull base surgery. You can combine techniques. You can go press sigmoid. I can go retro sigmoid. You can go subtemporal. You need to be prepared for the approach. Sometimes you need more. Sometimes you need less. But don't do the approach. And then you say this. I do this. I just can do like this. I just follow it. I go faster here. See, see the part. In the microscope is the middle foot, left side, okay? I'm coming to the open the dura, open the microscope. Here's the fifth nerve. See? I will follow the tumor. I will follow the nerve. From see, you liberate the five in the middle fossa here. Now I have the fifth nerve since the posterior fossa to the superior fossa. One of the tricks of meningioma surgery, do not dissect the nerves and the vessel. Dissect the arachnoid. Keep the arachnoid to the vessels. It's one of the tricks of the meningioma surgery and the skull base surgery. And you can follow the, the nerve. See, why I open retro seek? Because for the press sigmoid approach, you cannot follow. See the yeah, fire from the posterior fire to the superior fire. You just follow it from the posterior fossa to the inferior fourth fossa. Just following. The anatomy, see. In the pre and post, you see, cavernosinus was not cavernosinus, pre and post, and preservation of external mobility of the eye. To end, I like to say something that there is no skull base from the nose, there is, is no skull base from the head, there is, is no skull base from anywhere if you don't go to the left. Go to the course. Learn how to do it. Come back home. Don't go to surgery. Don't go to the OR. Go to the lab again. Go to the anatomy department. You know, in the anatomy de department, it's very old cadaver. In Brazil, the, the cadaver in the anatomy department is, is very bad. The quality is not good. You cannot see the artery and the vein blue and red and blue, but the anatomy is the same. If you go to the anatomy department, you are not going there to, to publish it, to do cases, to give lectures. You go to learn the anatomy. It's the only way to learn skull based surgery. You go to the lab. I spent almost three years in my life, Dr. Omefti lab in 93 to 96. During that time, more than 500 neurosurgeons from around the world crossed to Little Rock to learn skull based surgery. The people that was there, they went to the lab, and spent several minutes, hours, day, and maybe years in the in the lab. They, today they are real skull based surgeons going around 360 around the head. Life is balanced. Skull base is balanced. Everything is balanced. Do what you believe that is better for your patient. Do what you believe that's the best way to do. Do what's the better you can do it. Thank you, thank you very much. And sorry for the very, very long time. Thank you. Thank you, IP. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bohr, but it was an excellent lecture. Lecture, lot of, lot of information. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Professor, I do you like to lead the discussion, sir? Well, uh, yeah, I was thinking uh, the discussion would be the most uh, interesting part. So we have experts from uh, not only all around the globe. We have uh, experts from um, all around the skull base too. So we have uh, open guys, endoscopic guys, uh, dual guys, everything. So there's a lot of uh, excellent uh, uh, surgeons on the panel as well. So uh, Sanford is here, Sabarij is here. I believe uh, Vlad is left, but 
I, I don't know if Yuha is here. Uh, so Ajit, I can see Ajit here. Hari was here for some time. Bakhtiar is, uh, I can see Bakhtiar here. So there's a lot of uh, people who can go, come ahead and uh, point out things as well as, uh, you know, have a discussion for some time so that uh, all of us can learn. So maybe I can start off with some questions. Uh, that's what I was discussing with Juan today. Um, you know, the dural openings in a cavernous, uh, in the cavernous sinus, one of the most important things is dural openings. So, um, you know, for example, how do you free the second nerve? Uh, how do you free the carotid? How do you free the third nerve? How do you free? Today, Louis was talking about the fifth nerve being the key. How do you free the fifth nerve? How do you combine all these into one dural incision, then go into the posterior fossa? How do you cut the tent? I mean, a pitoclavial meningioma, uh, how do you take out a piece of tent? So all these are important things. So maybe uh, people would start to uh, I mean, people can start talking about their experience, both endoscopic as well as open. Uh, small tips and uh, you know, small discussions so that we can all uh, talk about our perspective later on. Maybe we can start off with one. Hora, you see, you, you, said you have Dr. Homan here. We have Dr. Lanzino here, we have Sanford here. <laughs> Hello, Sanford, how are you? I saw your Thanks. presentation yesterday. I saw your presentation yesterday, it was wonderful. You see the remote petrol tape is releasing there. Yeah, yeah, very nice, very nice. We have Juan Luis Gomez Amador here. Juan Luis, are you here? Juan Luis is from Mexico, he's an excellent skull base surgeon. With many work in, in there. <coughs> Hello, yes, have so, so, I have so many people here that. Uh, one of the tricks that 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 I use to liberate the nerves, especially the opt nerve and the fifth nerve, is to liberate before touch. See, if you go to the fifth nerve, we how I and release the fifth nerve. I will. I remove the petrous apex, see, identify the fifth nerve, see, and go from inside to outside to open the dura and to liberate the foramen, the, 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 the aperture of the dura that the, the, the fifth nerve is, is crossing, see. But, but fifth nerve for me is a big problem, you know. The patient wake up with some, uh, uh, this is uh, how say uh, this is Tessia. This is Tessia. This is Tessia. And so, sometimes we have one month, two months, three months. I'm learning a lot with fifth nerve. Uh, now I'm I don't know if if there is a coagulation. Some situation we have a very nice arachnoid wall over the fifth nerve that you can see identified very well. Sometimes the peeling is not so easy. In situation that the peeling is not so easy, the patient wake up with dysesthesia. And I'm fighting with this, you know, the fifth nerve. For the opt nerve, <coughs> I believe that the great majority of the people that have no improvement <coughs> or short improvement of the vision, it's because they mobilize the nerve. They try to remove the tumor before open the false foreign ligament. For example, for tuberculosis cell meningioma that is superior in latter. Before remove the tumor, I totally free the opt nerve, open the false form ligament. Now you can, go, can do work. When you open the false form ligament, you see that there is one area that was the nerve was, was damaged. See? It's very important to, before, before touch, to free, 
totally the nerve. I think this is the trick. See. And for me, in the superior optal fissure is the big problem. Because the three nerves are together. You can preserve anatomically, but the vascularity you lose. I respect a lot the superior orbital fissure in the lateral wall, see? Okay? I spoke too much. <laughs> do you drill and open oh the superior God. orbital Do you drill and open the superior orbital fissure completely, Luis? Oh, I, I open the dura. I do the peeling, okay? I remove the bone. Totally, totally, to free totally. Bone and dura, not nerves, not separate the nerves. Dura and bone, totally the lateral wall, totally the anterior clinoid, peeling of the dura, but not separate the nerves. When I try to separate the nerves, I'm talking about meningiomas, okay? Talk about meningiomas. The other tumors is okay. They give you the space for you. You just follow it. Meningioma is the big problem. It's the big problem. When I do this, I prefer to leave a small piece there and follow it. In very instant, interest, very hair, this tumor grow. Maybe you cut the vascularization, maybe it's, I wait. If the tumor starts to grow, I give radio surgery. But if the tumor is quiet, I wait. I never use radio surgery in advance. The problem IP, you don't know, is this today the people say that uh, also in pituitary, that you cannot go to the cavernous sinus, you don't need to go to the cavernous sinus, it's very dangerous to go to the cavernous sinus. But they give radiation. It's worse. You are killing the gland. You are killing the nerve. <laughs> Not in that time, but it's a matter of time. See? Yeah, it's we must fine. bring together oh. all these. All somebody, has to, somebody has to talk. Uh, just me are talking. Juan has to talk. <laughs> what is Juan Luis? Uh, we have two Juan here. Juan Luis and Juan Carlos. Very Juan Luis. Miranda. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Juan Miranda is here. We know. We know Juan Miranda is yeah, here. Yes, sir. He's here. He's here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm Juan here. Luis, watching Luis. Juan Luis to... Gomez Amador also is here. So no, I agree. Uh, a couple of points. So first, understanding the dural layers is so important for cavernous cavernous sinus is a dural base structure. So understanding the dura, the attachments, how things go in and out of the cavernous sinus is the key from open, from endonasal, that is, and it's not easy. It's, it's, it's actually not easy. It takes, as uh, Luis said, a lot of time going to the lab, doing dissections and watching surgeons, masters, and then doing it yourself. It takes a lot of time and work. Fernandez, Grande. Radiation, and uh, I, I agree with you, Luis. I mean, I, I am very conservative with radiation and I'm very aggressive with surgery. Um, I, I don't like to reveal a front and uh, I see, you know, a lot of problems that all of you see when you radiate tumors too much and you have to reoperate on tumors that have been operated three times, radiated three times and a lot of complications happen. So I leave radiation for last. Uh, well, Professor Yuan, I would like to ask you something. Do you like to chase all the non-functional pituitary adenomas going into the cavernous sinus? Do you think that all the non-functional tumors should be completely removed? Or you would like to leave a residue in the cavernous sinus if the tumor is very fibrous, etc.? So I do, I try, regardless of whether it's functional or not. If it's functional, I know I have to be aggressive for sure. If it's non-functional, I'm still aggressive. Um, but if the tumor, the tumor is fibrous, I stuck to the career, I'm not going to risk it too much. Um, but I'm still going to go there and open the cavern of silos and remove tumor off the carotid. Especially if the tumor is, if the patient is younger. Um, so yeah, I am aggressive even with non-functional tumors, I am too. To 
we have here Dr. Juan Luis Gomez Amador, IP. Juan Luis is from Mexico, from National Institute of uh, Mexico. He was a, a great neurosurgeon, great experience. He does a lot of uh, endoscope. He does open. And IP, he, he, he's a little bit crazy, you know? He removed uh, a cover noma through, through the, the brain stem through the nose. <laughs> but he's good. He's good. <laughs> well, Luis, go ahead, please. Okay, please let him have his uh, view, please. Yeah, uh, good morning to everyone. I, I want to thank the excellent presentations by Borba, by you, and by Professor Fernandez Miranda. Uh, we, we have a series of uh, functioning pituitary adenomas con with compromise in the cavernous sinus. At the beginning, we were using neuromonitoring in order to preserve the function of the nerves. But later we saw that uh, actually there is no damage after the surgery when you go to the cavernous sinus to the endoscopic adenosine approach. And we have also used the stimulation of the sixth nerve, but also uh, without uh, encountering any, any damage to the nerve after the surgery. So not, now we are not uh, performing uh, neuromonitoring anymore for, for specific cases when uh, usually the functioning tumors into the, in, inside the cavernous sinus, they, they usually do not compromise the posterior uh, compartment of the cavernous sinus. And uh, uh, besides that, I would like to add that uh, Dr. Fernandez Miranda and Dr. Borba show us that there is a new kind of skull-based surgeon today. So the skull-based surgeon that is using endoscopic approach, dolenic approach, etc. whenever the patient needs something specific. So I, I think this is a message for all the young neurosurgeons that uh, we need to use all the technology, all the tools and the techniques available to offer the patient a, a bit the best outcome. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment, Juan. I agree with you, you know, I'm using less and less neurophysiology for monitoring because I see it has little utility. It doesn't help much. It adds time. It adds costs. Some there are side effects, you know, like a blue eye from the needles. So I'm using it very selectively these days. I use it usually when I go to the lateral compartment, like a NOSP for adenoma, and then I'm using for chordomas uh, or chondosarcomas, etc. But I'm using less and less. About your second comment, I think you're totally right in terms of how the field of skull disease has changed. And the problem at the beginning is I think there were or there still is a group of people from the, there were pituitary surgeons that they move into a, in the nasal skull base surgery, as opposed to being a skull base surgeon that moves into in the nasal and pituitary surgery. I think there is a different paradigm there in terms of how you do things. I see Dr. Sanford here, Sanford? I be suffer from from Taiwan. He's a very experienced. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your excellent speech. I totally agree with you uh, about the uh, concept. And for me, uh, actually, uh, I think uh, for most of the pathologies surrounding the cavernous sinus, the trigeminal nerve is really the center of the pathology. So um, now nowadays. I uh, preferred uh, at the beginning, I opened the macoscape so that I can mobilize the trigeminal nerve. And for the macoscape is actually on the uh, later wall of the cavernous sinus. But by opening the macoscape and mobilizing the trigeminal, and this is the way to open the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. In that way, you can localize the grubal ligament and also uh, you can delineate and you can localize the meningo hypophysial trunk. And so at the beginning, you can devascularize the tumor. So nowadays, I prefer, I start to open the Makox cave, mobilize the trigeminal, and devascular the tumor. And also, if you mobilize the trigeminal, you can expose the, uh, most of the time, you can expose the petrous apex. If you remove the petrous apex, is much more easier to localize the uh, derailed kalel. So this is what I'm, uh, nowadays my, uh, I change my uh, technique and concept and I would like to share with you. Thank you. 
Yes, excellent. Uh, yeah, uh, Sanford, excellent uh, view on that uh, from lateral yeah. aspect. Also, yeah. also uh, Lewis uh, mentioned uh, you always leave a piece of tumor uh, in the severe orbital fissure. I totally agree with you. But for other tumors, there's uh, some tricks to remove the part just below the severe orbital fissure. The most important is you have to uh, open the uh, inner membrane along the ocular motor nerve. And you have to totally uh, mobilize the ocular motor nerve so that you can uh, just put a little push the, the ocular motor nerve a little bit and you can enter the superior wall of the cabinet sinus. So you can remove more and much part of the tumor just uh, within the severe orbital fissure. But not the case in meningioma, like Louis said. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the questions we've had uh, is uh, how do you, uh, is a private question. So, how do you uh, manage the superior petrosal sinus bleeding um, when you? the uh, metal scape. Anybody yes, want to I, answer that? Yes, I opened the uh, metal scape. Actually, I will cut the, uh, the dura at the temporal base so that I can expose the tentorium. And then I cut the metal scape, then I follow the tentorium. I cut the tentorium to widely open the, the aperture of the metal scape. Then I extend the incision of tentorium towards the incisura medially and towards the severe petrosal sinus laterally. But it's only after you remove the uh, anterior petrus. So when you reach the severe petrosal sinus, I can put two uh, hemoclip just uh, to ligate the sinus and I go uh, further the incision down to the posterior fossa. In this way, I can totally open the space to the preponding space and the posterior fossa. Yes, excellent. No, when, when you open the dura in the posterior fossa, open the base of the, uh, we talk about the anterior petrosal approach now. No? Yeah. You open the dura in the posterior fossa, you open the posterior in the middle fossa, in the middle will be the superior petrosal sinus. In the way that you can cut, can coagulate, can do whatever you want. Okay, and put clippers in. But one trick you should never use. Sometimes bleed, you can inject glue, but the glue cannot go to the back. It's very dangerous, very, very, very dangerous. I used to, to inject the glue a lot. Now I'm doing less and less. The other day I did a, a, a Transcondylar approach. And I inject, I inject the glue, the, the, the tissue, tissue, I'm sorry, tissue, tissue, call, I don't know how, how you call this. The, yeah, it's around a... the plexus of vertebral artery. Okay? The vertebral artery, man, was nice, was perfect, beautiful. When I opened the dura, there was a piece of glue intradural. Then has communication to everywhere. Because see, I'm, I'm now I'm a little bit concerned about glue. I saw a very prominent surgeon doing a peeling of the middle fossa. See, he inject very close to the, to the anterior clinoid. When he opened the dura, there was a big piece of glue filling the superior temporal artery and uh, superior temporal vein in the sebum fissure, completely full. Because this glue is, is dangerous, it's dangerous. I, I know that the people use a lot. I see the people use a lot. Professor Yuga described the technique, but I don't know, <laughs> but he doesn't use too much, just enough. The difficult is to know how much is enough. <laughs> Go ahead, Ike. 
Yeah, so uh, the superior petrosal sinus is some place, uh, one place I would never ever use the glue, as you said, which, is, uh, which uh, you rightly said, um, that's, that can give rise to really disastrous complications. But uh, uh, earlier we used to use the hemoclip, but now there is no need for the hemoclip. We always bipolar, cut, bipolar, cut, bipolar. That's more than enough. Um, I mean, earlier we used to use uh, occluding sutures, then we used to use hemoclips. All these are not necessary. Uh, most of the time you can get away with just bipolar. Uh, and, but it's very, very important to do a petrosectomy before you do this. Otherwise, uh, if you start to open, then you can have terrible bleeding because you need to control on both sides. So, uh, that's the uh, answer to the question. It's answered by all these experts. Anything else we know? Uh, yes, sir. I would like to ask uh, Professor Yuan, how does he really differentiate between the inferior paracellar ligament and the inferior hypophyseal artery? Because at times, when the field is bloody, you feel confused whether this is the artery or the ligament. Uh, so can Professor Yuan really comment on how he differentiate between the ligament and the artery? The inferior paracellar ligament and the inferior hypophyseal artery. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. The, I mean, working inside the cavern of sinus is difficult to have a pristine view, but I try my best to get a very clean view. And I do so, and this goes back to the use of glue or no glue. I never use glue when I work in the cavern of sinus. You don't want to use glue when you're going to work inside the cavern of sinus. You use glue when you want to work around the cavern of sinus, but you're going to work inside. I use, you know, flow seal or, or surgery foam, as it's called, you know, they, you, all, you guys are all familiar with that. This is excellent material because it dissolves and you can wash it out very easily. And they have a special applicator for that so I can apply it very, very precisely. So I put that, put a patty irrigate so I can clean the field as much as possible. Uh, but sometimes I, if I see a ligament in an area, I just coagulate everything I see. I coagulate both and I cut. Even sometimes, um, I think it's the ligament, but I still coagulate it just in case. I think there is nothing wrong with that. You just be, want to be safe. It, and this goes to another question that they asked to the forum, which is how do you deal with the bleeding in the cavern of sinus? And it's very important you differentiate the type of bleeding you're having. If you have just venous bleeding, packing with the gel foam, with, with the flow seal, I mean, is very effective. But if you have some arterial bleeding, and I'm not talking about carotid bleeding because that's obvious, you can, you know, it's massive bleeding. But if it's minor arterial bleeding, packing is not gonna solve the problem usually, just with flow seal. And there is a risk of post-op hematoma, even pseudoaneurysms, because you can have bleeding from the origin of the inferior hypophysial artery from the carotid wall. And that you need to identify and you need to coagulate. I think bipolar coagulation works great for that. In my experience, I've had a number of holes in the of the origin of the inferior hypophysial artery, or meningo hypophysial trunk, and I just seal that with a bipolar, <clears throat> and that's very effective. If that doesn't work, then I will use a muscle patch. I'll take a muscle patch from somewhere, and I patch the muscle in that wall of the carotid. But again, don't try to pack arterial bleeding if it's minor, because you can get into trouble later. Try to fix it. Uh, well, Professor Yuan, I think I would like to ask you one another question. Uh, what do you advise the young pituitary surgeons uh, to start with cavernous sinus? You advise them to go first in the superior compartment and then to, is there some, some protocol like that? Um, okay, that's a good question too. If you don't have experience, I think um, the superior compartment is the safest to work because it's the safer to access, you go above the carotid, and because the third nerve is usually protected, is usually, it is protected by a dural membrane, unless the tumor has broken through that membrane, which is not common. So it's very safe and you can be aggressive with the suction and the third nerve is gonna be fine most of the time. Now working in the posterior compartment is more tricky. First, because you need better exposure. You need to expose the vertical carotid as it enters the cavern of sinus, so you can move it carefully. And you can find the meningohepocele trunk, you can find the sixth nerve, which is not protected there. And you have more venous bleeding because the inferior petrosal sinus opens there, also the superior petrosal sinus. So it's more tricky. And then next is the, uh, um, the inferior compartment. It's even more risky because you have to open the anterior wall, work below the gene of the carotid. You're getting the sixth nerve just lateral to it. 
Um, so it's, there's a high risk of signal pulse in that area. So I would go superior, posterior, inferior, and then lateral, if you want to go in that order. No, but is it, is it more difficult to control the bleeding from the venous confluence than from the cavernous sinus? Um, it's more brisk. Um, I, I don't think it's difficult. You just pack it with your, with your flow seal. Another trick you can use that is very simple is just use reverse from Dellenberg. Just elevate the head of the patient and that decreases the venous flow. And actually, it really helps controlling bleeding. Uh, for this, I use a bed, a special bed that allows you to put the bed very you know, 40 centimeters from the floor. So when I, re I do reverse T, I can still be comfortable operating with my hands in 90 degrees. So ergonomics in the OR are also very important, as you all know. So I use a special bed for that, allow to do reverse to Dellenberg, very important. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Saberish as well as Roman Bojniak uh, from oh. Ljubljana. Roman is uh, the director at Ljubljana. I've been there. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. And uh, Roman does some really world-class endoscopic work. So he's got a lot of publications of endoscopic work. So Roman, would you like to say something? Yes, of course. Um... I must um, <laughs> just want to. Uh, so we hear, yes. Um, first of all, I would like to say that this is a uh, amazing lectures, and uh, they saw that the, there is a space for cavernous sinus surgery still going on. So. <clears throat> I would stress that I never needed or I never had the need to uh, perform orbitozygomatical trepanation. So all the surgeries we were doing transcranially, uh, they are possible with pterional. And <clears throat> I agree with the exposure of the superior orbital fissure is not suitable and it is concerned with high morbidity. But I was uh, very happy to see the, uh, this endonasal part that it is, uh, like it is also my opinion that uh, it has very, very little uh, um, nerve, cranial nerve morbidity. So uh, here I would stress that maybe there is one thing to stress about the sixth nerve and this is that the six nerves which comes from the lateral aspect of paraclival carotid it is generally tethered by the sympathetic nerves so if you work very much on the lateral inferior aspect you can in fact pull the sixth nerve uh, through these sympathetic nerves who are coming from the carotid adventitia. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, maybe for, I was happy that uh, Dr. Fernandez mentioned that uh, Knoz grade is not useful exactly about uh, predicting invasion completely because he does say nothing about anterior and posterior compartments. So it is just one, um, what to say, um, cross section, which is in coronal plane, but nothing say what is anterior, what is posterior to the horizontal part. So we were always checking from all perspective when we were doing planning. And for the lateral uh, mobilization, um, it should be mentioned that this proximal ring. Uh, Excuse me, Roman. Uh, Roman, you're not showing anything. We're not seeing anything. You would like to show something, yeah. Oh, I thought you, I, are you trying to share something now? Uh, I can, yes. Oh, I didn't know if you were or not. I wasn't sure. Yeah, just a moment. Okay. Um, we, we should give you credit that Dr. Homan was on the First paper in the narrow cavernous sinus seen from, from below. Yeah, we were. He is, is a pioneer in this area. We were doing it. <laughs> yeah, many, many. Some years ago, Dr. Yeah. Hey, Roman. Yeah, wonderful paper. He just shared with us last week. 
Yes, so I hope that uh, you can see something now. Yes, now you yeah. can see. Yes, we can see. Here, here is the part how we are doing the opening into the lateral compartment. So this is the anterior loop of the carotid here. And here is the expanded cella. Oh. Are we here again? I don't know if you hear me again. We yes, can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. okay. We can hear you. So we are doing this bluntly, but it's uh, going very slowly. So first we check where is attachment to the proximal ring in this horizontal part. Of course, before we did extensive drilling of the optic strut. So when we check bluntly, then we do dissection. So here you can see carotid under the dura. So for is horizontal cut and then it's the vertical cut. Uh, I'm sorry that this is not uh, going so fast. So now you see the <clears throat> vertical cut we will do, but first we do blunt checking and we are already on the lateral side. So now it is uh, <clears throat> the straight cut under in the direction of the optic strut, which was drilled off. So in this way, we completely dissect the dural ring, proximal dural ring from the anterolateral way. And in this direction, you can see that um, carotid can be mobilized. So here we see the tumor on the lateral aspect of the carotid. I hope now it will start. So it's not uh, going fluently, but but now maybe this is the part. So as you see, we did start with the paracellar dissection the lateral side. So we do not remove the majority of the tumor first. And uh, so when we uh, enter the adenoma, it can be removed by a piecemeal. I hope I will sh could show you this one. So now we do mobilization, in fact, medialization of the anterior loop. And here you see the adenoma. So here, one of the main obstacles would be that if it will work, if it would work too hard with the aspirator. So we are doing this gently and we are not pushing anteriorly. So we are sucking the tumor toward the aspirator because what is in front behind in front is the oculomotor nerve, which is not protected here. So you see that I cut the rest one piece of the ligament. And after continuing, so we make uh, quite good emptying. And uh, <clears throat> at the end, uh, we were able to go all around the carotid with a sector. Now you can see how I this very well. So 
And here, what we will see a little whitish, this will be the ocular motor in below. But we are never touching it with the aspirator. And what is most important is that the aspirator must not be drilled and sharp. So one of my carotid injury was because the aspirator was sharp once, because we are not using this uh, single used. So. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Dr. Bosniak. I, I have a different set of dice of uh, sections for drilling and for uh, tumor dissection. I, and I try not to mix them just to prevent that from happening. Yes, no, I, I also have now two. One is virgin and one is used. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here yeah. you can see that it's now the anterior, yes, anterior loop is now completely free and snapping lateral nighting behind and uh, and now we are going trans diaphragmal and going for the last piece of tumor this was growing uh, extracellular to the intradural space so i didn't show you the mri but uh, this is the point so so maybe this one is even better so uh, here we have completely mobilized carotid. So we are here. And when we were moving in this short video, we can see the lateral wall. This is one of the nerves, I think we too. Roma, we are not seeing the video. You are not seeing the video. No. Oh, okay, then. Okay, then we can, then we can skip, I think so. Then we will skip this. Thank you. Okay. You, you need to take that video off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So this is I want just to say that uh, with four meningioma, I also had the expression that uh, sometimes observation is enough because in these huge uh, meningiomas, nothing happens. So we really did not have any problems for, for years. So, but our oncologists, of course, they say if we radiate, then we have at least 10 years uh, peace with the disease. So, <laughs> yeah. So thank you. This is just what I would like to remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman. Uh, thank you for showing that beautiful, beautiful video. Um, I, have, I would like to say a couple of things. Um, uh, excellent uh, presentation um, uh, from both uh, champions here, IEP and one on either side <laughs> competing really. Um, I, my exposure is mainly open. I don't do a lot of endoscopic uh, in the cavernous sinus. But most of my exposure is managing the carotid around the paraclinoid region and aneurysm surgery around the paraclinoid region. Um, and I, I initially used to do a lot of intradural tailored clinoidectomy. And I've slowly realized that more and more I do extradural complete anterior clinoidectomy and expose the clinoidal carotid there so that you have proximal control before you can get to the aneurysm. I think that's much safer. Uh, I would like to uh, 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 insist on that because, you know, it's much safer than having everything in the arachnoid space open and trying to drill down your carotid. It's much safer to do the clinoidectomy completely extradural and mobilize the optic nerve before you get intradural to do even tumors, aneurysms, whatever in the paraclinoid region. Um, the, the second thing is, um, IEP was uh, telling the drilling of the posterior clinoid. I think it's the, one of the most dangerous and precise drilling you have to do in the subarachnoid space because you're around uh, two vessels and a nerve. Um, and I think uh, using the, the bone sonopet has made it much safer because you don't have a rotating drill bit. Um, and that is something that I think we should say it's better to use a bone sonopet than use a drill. 
Um, and uh, proximal carotid aneurysms, you know, especially superior hypophyseal, even PCOMs, and a lot of PCOMs, then you cannot get a proximal control. Um, I think doing a good extradural anterior craniotectomy and opening the dura, having planoral proximal control gives you significant access. Petroclival tumor, similarly, I think when you come around the petroclival tumor, um, you have uh, a lot of the petroclival tumors actually come in the front, uh, enlarging the Meckel's cave, coming near the carotid artery, sometimes come multi-compartmental through the superior orbital fissure, encasing the carotid. So you get good vascular control. And similarly, you can dissect your PCAs away once you take, cut your tent and you can get all your vascular exposure so that now you know what are all the safe things and then you're just having the castle of the tumor to dissect. So I think transcavenous approach with an extradural clinodectomy is a workhorse for skull-based surgery. And I think we all need to master that very well to get to majority of the skull-based um, pathology. Excellent. Uh, Vinod, uh, you can go ahead and uh, decide as to what should be done next, please. So actually, the next lecture is on September 6th. That's on Peter's Apex. And it'll be at, at around 5.30 PM Indian Standard Time. And we'll have Professor Paul Gardner speaking on endoscopic and Professor Louis Boba, and you can speak on open approach. And then we'll have talks on, subsequent talks will be on CP angle that the dates are not yet finalized. And I think today uh, we already cleared a lot of doubts and I think we could probably wind up the session. There are no more suggestions and comments. So I would yes, like to, uh, I'd like to say, hand over the uh, mic to Professor by Aipchiren to conclude the session. Yeah, I mean, uh, today was a beautiful session. I also learned a lot. Uh, we had a lot of uh, elite uh, panelists uh, talking about the real experts, talking about their views on the cavernous sinus surgery from both endoscopic as well as open. So um, Corona has given us this excellent opportunity to sit down together and learn from each other. So let's keep this continuing. Looking forward to the Peter's Apex now. I would invite all of you to be panelists there as well. And uh, uh, so looking forward to September 6th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you, you once again, Professor Yuan Fernandez Miranda, Dr. Professor Luis Boba, and Dr. Ibe Cherry, and Dr. John Bennett, and all the panelists. Thank you once again from the heart. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you for that. Good day. Thank you. Thank you.